recording started. That's wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. This is our fifth session of Black History Lunchtime Conversations. Um, and on behalf of um, uh, Learning Links International, Caroline and I are here to represent them. I'm hoping that our colleague, Natalie Fagan Brown, may join us presently. Um, and Belong Nottingham, which is represented by um, Simon Fringo uh, today. Um, thank you very much indeed, Simon, for your support. And also David Alston, who's been um, a bit of an inspiration for this. So it's great that, David, uh, this lunchtime we're going to have your presentation because it was conversations that, um, that David and I were having on Zoom as we got more confident with Zoom. Um, that inspired me that other people might like to join in these conversations. It was all so interesting. So um, it's great. So I think we'll just make a start then. So, uh, David, I don't know if you've got a PowerPoint presentation or are you just talking with us? I've got a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm just going to share my screen. Wonderful. Um, Simon? Yep. Okay. Uh, Can you enable the screen sharing? Yeah, I'm enabling it now we're all getting better at this all the time you know we're, and i'm hoping the volume is going all... to be better for me with my earphones in now okay then that's looking good david so okay, uh, you, can, you can all can see you, that can you all switch your mics off please and um we'll let david go through his presentation and then we'll have time for questions afterwards thank you very much indeed david Right, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to make this presentation, Liz. I want to try to give people some flavour of the extent of involvement of people from the Highlands of Scotland in slave plantations in the Caribbean and in the slave trade itself. Um, it, um, it, I think it... Oh, sorry, I'm having difficulty moving my slides on. Hold on. Yeah, um, I... I think it probably helps if I explain where I am. Um, I'm in a, a very small town called Cromarty in the north of Scotland, and that's in the Northern Highlands, that bit there. And then if we look at that in a bit more detail, um, the place you might recognize is Inverness at the bottom of that slide, and, and I'll refer to Inverness. And just north of that, um, at the tip of that peninsula is Cromarty where I am. Very appropriately, that peninsula is called the Black Isle. About 20 years ago, I began to notice connections between where I live and slave plantations in Guyana, in, in, in Demerara, and particularly in the part of Guyana called Berbice. And I began to explore that. So over the last 20 years, I've researched it. I've now got a, a database of about 650 individuals who are part of that connection between the Highlands and Guyana and there's 400 pages on, on this website. So if, if you want to explore what I've done on these connections, just go to Google Slaves and Highlanders. Um, but what I'd like to do today is to give something of a broader account because over the last three or four years, I've begun to look more widely at the involvement of the Highlands of Scotland with slave plantations and with slavery. So I want to talk about accounts of slavery. Now that's in two senses. One is um, first-hand accounts of slavery, but also accounts of slavery in the sense of, of, of the accounts, because as, as the William Goldman said back in the 70s, if you want to understand the crime, follow the money. Um, and one of the ways we can follow the money is looking at the compensation that was paid to slaveholders at the end of slavery. And I'm going to show two slides. Um, that's, the, that's the colonies in which the slaves were held for whom compensation was paid. And you can see that Jamaica, the compensation is over six million pounds, but the next one is British Guyana, now Guyana, where it's over four million pounds. So these two colonies between them get more than half of the compensation money. The, the holders of the slaves get more than half of the compensation money. But look at this. Um, the val what was paid in compensation wasn't a flat rate across the, the British colonies. It related to the assessed value of those who were held as slaves in each of the colonies. And there's three colonies there where the, comp the, the assessed compensation value is 50 pounds or more for each slave. And that's Honduras, British Guyana and Trinidad. Whereas in Jamaica, the assessed value is less than 20 pounds per enslaved person. And what does that tell us? It tells us 
that in these three colonies on the left, money is still being made. Fortunes are still being made in sugar plantations. And this is where the interest is greatest in maintaining the system of slavery. And once it ends, where interest is greatest in finding alternative labor force in indentured Indian labor. I think a lot of the history of former British colonies in the Caribbean, um, these two slides help to illustrate the, uh, what's going on. But I also want to talk about accounts of slavery in the sense of, of first-hand accounts of slavery. And this book, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil and Wicked Traffic of the Slavery and Commerce of the Human Species, is the first account written in English by an African of the experience of being enslaved. And it's by Otoba Kuguano, who was enslaved and taken to be a slave in Grenada. His, mas his, his master then took him to London and he arrived just after the Somerset judgment and was able to reclaim his freedom, left, his, left the man who had held him as a slave and became a house servant to two artists, Richard and Maria Cosway. And so we actually have a picture, which is almost certainly of Kuguano, in, in, um, that's him with Maria Cosway. Um, it, it's in a way, it's a pity that the only picture we have of him is is of him as a servant, but nevertheless, we, we are able to see him. And it was through um, the causeways that he was introduced to some of the leading abolitionists, um, particularly Granville Sharp. And these abolitionists helped him um, to publish his book. Now the book went almost unnoticed because he was uncompromising in his views. Um, he believed slavery should be abolished immediately, that the enslaved had not only a right, but a duty to rebel against the slaveholders, and that everyone in Britain was to some, in some degree or other responsible for slavery. Um, it wasn't a message that went down well with the public, and that I think is why the book didn't get much notice. Here's the, the man who held him as a slave, and here's the Highland Connection. This is Alexander Campbell from the island of Isla on the west coast of Scotland who rose to become one of the most prominent planters in Grenada. Um, he was part of a, a large family. Um, I think he was probably a Gaelic speaker as well as an English speaker. Um, he rose and he came to represent the planters in Grenada. And that's why he came back to London. And by this point, uh, Kuguano had become his personal servant and, and Kuguano was brought back to London. Um, Alexander Campbell campaigned on behalf of planters in Grenada, first of all for the reduction of taxes, and then in 1790 gave evidence to Parliament in support of the system of slavery. Um, and I put that little quote from the, the title of title page of Kuguano's book at the, at the bottom, he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or maketh merchandise of him, or if he be found in his hand, then that thief shall die. And Alexander Campbell did die violently because he was one of 48 people executed in 1795 in the Fedon Revolution or Rebellion in Grenada, which involved several thousand enslaved people and the number of hundreds of free people of colour on the island. So um, there we can see the slaveholder and the formerly enslaved man um, and, and, and the relationship between them. Um, here's another account of slavery. I'll come to, the, to the, the Highland Connection in a moment. It's an account, it's the first account um, written, um, th that came to public attention, um, written by a, a former a surgeon on a slave ship, Alexander Falconbridge, who'd been employed as a surgeon, but then became an abolitionist. And you see on that page, the three tools that the abolitionist movement used in their campaign. Um, what we now call a logo, um, which was, was the brand for the campaign. It was where you showed you were an abolitionist, but that, that the, the figure of the, the kneeling African, um, which we designed by Josiah Wedgwood. Um, the graphic illustration of what it, of, of a slave ship, which showed so, um, so visibly what it meant to reduce people to commodities and to pack them into a slave ship. Uh, Simon Sham has described it as the most widely read and graphic account of the physical cruelties of the slave trade. So he's described Falconbridge's book in that way. 
Um, Falconbridge also gave evidence to Parliament um, in the cause of abolition in 1790. Now, what's the Highland connection? Well, um, from the evidence to Parliament, we know the slave ships that Falconbridge sailed on, and the most of his voyages were on a slave ship called the Emilia, which was captained by a Highland captain, James Fraser. Um, He's not buried here, but this is Glen Convent for about 30 miles from where I am, uh, where he came from. Uh, and in Falconbridge's account and in James Fraser's account, we get competing versions of the, the same slaving voyages. I think it's Falconbridge, we believe. Um, when he died, um, James Fraser owned a share in this plantation in Demerara, Doch Fuhr. Now, Doch Fuhr is here at the, at the head of Loch Ness in the Highlands of Scotland. That's Doch Fuhr House. And in the grounds of Doch Fuhr House um, is the grave and the memorial to Evan Bailey, who was the owner of these slave ships. Now, Evan Bailey lived to the age of 95, died in 1835, just long enough to get the compensation money. Um, and his career had spanned, spanned direct involvement in St. Kitts and Nevis in Grenada, then his return to London along with his brothers, where he became a merchant and a financier of the slave trade, and finally living long enough, as I say, to get the compensation. That memorial, I think, might be the largest memorial to a slave trader in Britain. And it was meant to be seen. Um, that's a not terribly clear picture of Loch Ness. There's Doc Fuhr House. And there's the, the, the obelisk, the memorial. It was meant to be seen as you came down the road by Loch Ness or as you came out of the, the newly constructed Caledonian Canal. Here's his brother, James Bailey, um, in a portrait by Gainsborough, which is now in the, in the Tate. And we can find out something about the slaves that they traded um, through the extremely well-documented Mount Traverse plantation on Nevis, which has also been excavated. This is the time team there in 1998-1999. Um, we know that in 1766, 30 of the enslaved people on Mount Traverse had been bought from the, from the, the partnership that the Baileys were involved in. And they included um, these people, and I'll just let you read these as they come up on the screen. Even in the world of slave trading, the Baileys didn't have a particularly good reputation. They were regarded as penny pinching. Um, their slaves often arrived in poorer condition than those being tra transported by other slave traders. And I think you can tell some of that from, from these individuals. Um, they're involved in the, that stage of the slave trade, which comes after the Middle Passage, the transport, the kidnapping and transportation of Africans across the Atlantic. The slave factors are involved in the rest of that supply chain, because that's what it was. Here's an, and, and in that supply chain, the, the enslaved are packed and parceled and directed to the markets where the most money is going to be made in smaller and smaller units. There's another slave ship, but it's actually initially difficult to see that it's a slave ship because it's a cargo ship that's been a, a, adapted to create a space just below the top deck that's a meter high where a number of slaves can be quite literally packed. The, the process then works by um, the slave factors um, then using local merchants, local auctioneers to, to sell the slaves. Um, and this is in Guyana, in my particular interest, 1804, and towards the end of the African slave trade, a very high proportion of those who are being enslaved are being directed to Guyana because Guyana is growing. Uh, and here's an advertisement from William Mackenzie and Company, um, who are offering for sale 300 what they call prime young Negroes. They've arrived on um, a, sh a ship which has a Scottish captain, P. MacDonald. Um, and the other partner in, I don't, I've never been able to work out who the William Mackenzie is, but his partner was John McLeod. And this is John McLeod's father um, from Guineas in Ross Shire. This is a, probably about 10 miles from where I am. 
Um, he was the, the sheriff, the principal legal officer in, in Ross Shire. And there's a display about him in the Museum of Scotland with his, his silverware. And that display tells us that he was a highly respectable local figure, typical of those whose adoption of enlightened ideas influenced life all over Scotland. No mention of the fact that his family were plantation and owners and slave traders. And um, so you know, hardly enlightenment ideas. Um, here's another way of following the money um, in the compensation. That's a league table of the partnerships which receive compensation. Um, some of them are obviously Scottish, these three because they're based in Glasgow. But another four are, are strongly Scottish. And I've just work up from the bottom, number seven, the Baileys, that's the, the Baileys, the next generation of the Baileys that I just mentioned, of Dochfuer. Above that, John Gladstone of Liverpool. John Gladstone is Scottish and his wife is from Dingwall. Um, less than 20 miles from, from where I am. Above that, Sandbach Tini and Company, that doesn't sound very Scottish, but it was founded by four men, a George Robertson, who um, came from about 10 miles away from I, where I am, James McEnroy, who was from Highland Perthshire, Charles Parker, who was a lowland Scot whose family had been in the, in the what's now the United States, and Samuel Sandbach from Cheshire, but both Sandbach and Parker married into the Robertson family. So it operated very much as a Scottish network, uh, initially both in Glasgow and Liverpool, and then transferring to Liverpool only by the, the time of compensation. But right at the top is Davidson Barclay, the partnership which received the largest amount of money. Um, the, there were two Barclays, the father Aeneas and the son Henry, this is Henry, who later became a colonial governor, including being, being governor of, of British Guyana. And this is their house in Cromarty, um, before and after recent restoration. Uh, and the Davidsons, the other two part members of this partnership, that family also came from Cromarty. So the site of the Davidsons house is about two minutes from where I'm sitting, and the Barclays house is about five minutes from where I'm sitting. And here's the other Cromarty um, on the coast of Guyana in the park called Burbees, and, and that's me. Um, and here's another of the estates on the coast, Bran. Now, Bran is again about 20 miles from where I am. Uh, there was a castle there, which is now gone, but it was the seat of the chiefs of Clan Mackenzie. And I want to tell you about one of the people who was enslaved on that plantation. His name was Inverness. Well, that wasn't his name. Um, we don't know his name, but that was the name that he was given um, when he was, was sold as, as a slave. Um, this isn't Inverness, but it's a contemporary. This is a drawing by a Scottish soldier in Berbice in 1806. Um, Inverness was enslaved in Africa, transported across the Atlantic, and came into the hands of a cousin of the Baileys, um, his name was George Bailey, and he at that point was one of the largest slave factors in the Caribbean. And then he was sold on through that company, Mackenzie and MacLeod, in, in Stabrock, the now Georgetown, the capital of Demerara. And he was bought by Peter Fairbairn, who was the secretary to Lord Seaforth, chief of Clan Mackenzie, who had invested with other Highland merchants in developing plantations in Berbice, part of Guyana. Peter Fairbairn had been sent out there to run the plantations and he bought um, in July 1804, um, 20 enslaved Africans, 10 men, 10 women. And the, the, the men were all given um, Highland names, Inverness, Dingwall, Ross, Sutherland, um, and, and so on. Um, Inverness was set to work on creating these plantations. This is what the this involved the building of seawalls, the digging of canals, enormous works of engineering, backbreaking work. It's um, I, I only came across this statistic earlier this week. Um, that work in creating the coastal plantations involved the digging of two and a half million miles of drainage canals and moving with hand tools, 100,000 tonnes of earth. Um, the Caledonian Canal that I mentioned involved moving 300,000 metric tonnes. And there's a little bit of maths to be done, but basically what was being done in, in Guyana by hand 
um, was the equivalent of the, of the digging of six Caledonian canals. Um, so it's not surprising that Inverness ran away. He ran away and then he was, he was recaptured. He ran away and, and the picture here of this other slave, Samson, is of a runaway slave. You can see that he's been shackled to a bit of wood that he's carrying over his shoulder and that he's wearing a metal columned collar with hooks at the end to prevent him getting through the bush. Um, that might have been what happened to Inverness, but nevertheless, Inverness escaped again. And we know that he remained free for some time. Um, he was probably still free in 1810, at the point at which the planters in Berbice and Demerara were becoming particularly concerned about the growth of a runaway camp, a maroon camp, on the, on the boundary between Berbice and Demerara. And every year they mounted expeditions um, to hunt down runaway slaves. These were run, these were launched from this plantation, a woodcutting plantation on the Meebury Creek off the Demerara River, which was owned by a Charles Edmund, Edmonston, a Scot. His wife was part Amerindian, which is why Charles Edmonston had the, the link with, the, uh, with Amerindians, which enabled him to mount these runaway hunting expeditions. Um, this is his house uh, after he returned to Scotland in Cardross near Dumbarton. Um, and in 1810, the expedition hunted down 100 Maroons, 70 were captured, um, 30 were killed, and the way in which the bounty was claimed was by cutting off the, the right hands of those who were killed and, and, and bringing these back. Now, Inverness was not among the slaves brought back alive, so he may have been among the 30 who were killed. And the point I want to make here about this enslaved African man who is given the name Inverness was that he was kidnapped, transported, auctioned, renamed, put to brack breaking, breaking work, escaped more than once, lived free and was finally probably hunted down and killed almost all by Scots and most of them from the Highlands of Scotland. There's another way in which the Highlands is involved in the slave plantations, and that's in this advert. This is again in Cromarty, and this serves as the remains of the hemp works in Cromarty. It's not, it's a factory, but it's not a mechanised factory. Um, and here, hemp was being imported from the Baltic and woven into a rough cloth, which was then being sent down to London to be made into bags and sacks. There was a similar factory in Inverness, and all of the product was marketed in the Caribbean as Inverness bagging. Um, it was, I think, the first thing that Inverness was, you know, the first Inverness brand. And you can see in this advertisement, um, bottom line, the ships just arrived and they're offering for sale real Inverness cotton backing. Inverness also benefited from money coming back to, fr from the plantations. This is the old Inverness Royal Academy. In the Highlands, we just call it the IRA, which tends to confuse people um, who, who are not familiar with our way of talking. Um, the, um, it was built with money, uh, a, lot, a significant amount of the donations to, to, for the building came from the Caribbean, from plantation owners. And in 1804, almost one in 10 of the pupils who attended the academy were from the Caribbean. Um, here's another building built at almost exactly the same time, uh, the Northern Infirmary, the first hospital in the Highlands. It's now the headquarters of the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, and one of the few buildings, public buildings, in which there's a, on which there's an acknowledgement of the source of the funding uh, which which helped to build it. Back to Cromarty. Um, here is a fairly modest house that belonged to a carpenter called William Fraser. He went out to Demerara, uh, sorry, went to Berbice, uh, made a considerable amount of money there, and it was in a relationship with Elizabeth Swain Bannister who was born a slave in Barbados, freed by her cousin, and either, and, and either went with William or, or went herself to Berbice and was then in a long-term relationship with her. When she died in 1827, she was probably the richest free woman of colour in Berbice. Um, their four children were educated in Liverpool and Scotland. Uh, one of their sons was very briefly um, apprenticed to the, the doctor in Cromarty and another son 
uh, ended up as a plantation and slave owner in Suriname uh, right until the, 19, the 1850s, 1860s, and so was one of the last Scots to be a slave owner. Um, here's, uh, this is the artist, uh, sculptor and, and dancer, Shanti Harris, um, with um, a performance that involved six bronze plaques that she'd made, um, commemorating six um, free women of colour who had a connection to the Highlands. You can see that the plaque for Elizabeth Swain Bannister. Next to it is the plaque, the one she's touching, um, Susanna Kerr. Um, Susanna's children, were, four children, were educated at Inverness, uh, the Inverness Royal Academy. And finally, um, here is a plaque to a, another of the children who were sent back for education in Scotland. This is Elizabeth or Eliza Junior. Um, her father was from very near where I am. Um, we don't know who her mother was. She would either have been an enslaved woman or a, a free woman of colour. Uh, but she and her brother were both sent back to be educated at Fortrose Academy, which is where my children went. And in 1818, Eliza won the prize for penmanship at the school. Um, the rest of her life is, is, is sad, but, uh, but we've been, I've been able to work out probably as much about her as I, I have of any of the other children um, who, who were sent back for, for education here. And she, she died. Um, in Fortrose um, in, in 1861. And I was delighted on Wednesday evening to be able to watch the premiere of a short film which has been produced for schools in Gaelic, there will be an English version, um, about the life of Eliza. Um, and that also includes um, a song that's been written um, Demerara, great is my love for Demerara. Uh, and that will be, uh, there will be a, a more public online showing of that film on the 28th of November. Um, I'll make sure details are available. If you want to find anything more about um, my own work, um, the easy, include, um, including the, the link to the, the Guyana pages, um, but there's other, there's other work relating to Caribbean as well. Just go to, to that page and I'll now stop sharing and um, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, but I'm not going to start with questions. I'm going to uh, open up now for, for questions. Um, Got a, a few comments here. Oh, right. Okay. We, uh, Jim, you were you are saying here you were born on the west coast, Demerara, in 1943, and then moved to London in 1961. Worked on the plantation for the age of seven with your parents, and you were so impressed by the presentation comments that it was a great piece of research which it is and it's great to hear that it's ongoing and that there are uh, things going on and certainly we'd like to book maybe the opportunity to see that film to showcase that film here that would be great so Jim do you want to add, uh, add could something I, else could I, could, I, could I ask which plantation Jim I can't see where Jim's gone he was here a bit ago Jim, Jim, unmute yourself, Jim. Unmute yourself. Jim? Yes. It was, good, good. It was in Leonora, and it was owned at different times by Sandbridge Parker and Company, and the Lord Booker, whom I met in the, really? in the House of Lords, and my colleagues had to restrain me from getting at him. But I say, David, this, this, I'm very touched. I've written on slavery, I've written on race relations, I've written over a dozen book, and I thought I knew Guyana very well. But clearly, from what you've said, I had no idea Guyana had featured so prominently in this trade, slave trade, and you really opened my eyes and extend my knowledge of my own country, which I'm so grateful. Thank, thank you very much. And it, this is very much a shared heritage. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention is that along the coast of, of Berbice, there are about 20 place names which are from 
precisely this part of the Highlands of Scotland. Um, I'm sure you would recognise them all, Jim. Yes. Um, and, but but that's not known here either. Um, we uh, we I, there's somebody who who, who um, did come to live in the Highlands who came from Verbeese, and one of the things she said is, "What? Why are there so many Verbeese place names in the Highlands of Scotland?" Thank you, thank right. you, David. Fascinating. Well, Jim, I'll put you in touch with David so you can yeah. communicate by email or on the phone or whatever. I'm sure he'll be fascinated to talk with you. He's so grateful. You have a wealth of He's so grateful, Liz. He seems a really great scholar, and it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, video Zoom meeting today. It's been enlightening, and I'm grateful. Great. Well, I'm really delighted you're here as well, Jim. It's really, really good. Good to see you there. Um, now, Richard has just uh, put up a message and he's saying he's wondering if you could, David, if you could say more about how the close connections between the Highlands and Guyana developed. Is it because of imperial networks and some Highlanders following others? And does it relate to Britain's relatively late capture of this region from the Dutch? Um, well, in a way, all of these, I think it's, I, th I think there's that point that people do tend to operate in networks and very often these networks are, are very specific to particular localities. Um, so that's one reason. Um, it, 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 but it's also got a lot to do with the involvement of Scots from an early point while it's still a Dutch colony. colony. Um, uh, particularly, um, uh, well, two families, um, uh, family of Cummings, from um, from Murrayshire, Thomas Cumming, who was there from the 1750s, married into to, to Dutch the Dutch planter class, and then his his cousin uh, Lachlan Cumming. Um, he's he's buried in uh, in in Murray in the north of Scotland, and his gravestone describes him as the principal promoter of the prosperity of Demerara. Um, and, and Jim will uh, will know that um, part of Georgetown is Cummingsburg, right. which which is 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 created by by him. Um, so so that's one of the reasons. Uh, and then another well, there are a number of other families, particularly the fam family of Frasers, Frasers of, of Belladrum, uh, about twenty miles from here, um, who get involved. So um, there's I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, it, it it's the late Ashton. Um, there is maybe that um, the sense that you, if, if you don't get involved now, you're going to lose out. And there's certainly a sense in the Highlands that this is where money can be made. People, people in Inverness around about 1800 are, are talking about becoming as rich as a Demerara man. Um, so it, it's like a pot of gold that's, that's, um, that's luring people. And it's very sad because the you know, this is very often young men, we're talking about, very often talking about teenagers, you know, 16, 17, 18, who are, who are, who are being sent out there. Um, in, and, and also, I think it's important to recognise that this is where the system of slavery is being pushed to its limits. The, the, the ratio of enslaved Africans to whites was at its most extreme in Berbice. Um, on... Um, so, it, so it is therefore also, I think, the place where brutality is most obvious because there, there is the, there's an overwhelming imperative to, to, to show how, despite how small in numbers, how, how strong power the white planter class are. Um, thank you very much, David. Professor Sati, I wondered if you wanted to make any comment. Can you just unmute yourself if you do want to? Professor Sati. Unmute yourself. We'll get there in a minute, Professor Sati. Unmute yourself. Okay, okay. Right, it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, 
I have nothing really uh, new to contribute except to thank David for his presentation. Um, like the other speaker said, uh, the issue of slavery, the last of it can never be heard of. <laughs> it, it, there's always something new to learn. And of course, I'm so delighted to learn about um, Guyana. The only question I would like to ask uh, is, 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 is a little bit of the presentation. And which is to ask about Walter Rodney. Uh, Walter Rodney, whose book we use so much in Africa, uh, was said to have been born in Guyana. I don't know how true that is. I, I don't know. Um, okay. But that's a very interesting question. So I'd, I'd like to try and find out. <laughs> okay. Are you referring to Walter Rodney, sir? Yes, Sorry? yes, Jim. Are you referring to Rodney. Walter Rodney, a Guyanese, who, who wrote a book, How Europe Underdeveloped yeah. Africa? Yeah, that's the person I'm referring to. Yes, I think I have a copy somewhere. If we can keep in touch afterwards, happy to loan you. No, I have a copy also. And All right. it's a book It's a book that is widely read in Africa. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. But well, he was murdered yes. by the government, the Burnham government. He yes. was murdered by the Burnham government, as you know, who wasn't democratic at all. Yeah, uh, okay. was saddened by the... And the question was, was he born in Guyana? And you're yes. saying yes. Yes, he, he was, was born in yes. Guyana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. so that's one okay. question answered. Thank yeah. you very and much. I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, yeah, I, I, I didn't hear clearly. The, there was some interference. So yes, born, born in Guyana. Yes. And, and he taught it in, in Jamaica at the University of West Indies. For many years, he was a senior lecturer at the University of uh, the West Indies yeah, in yeah. Jamaica. Well, great contributions there. Now, Professor Sato is joining us from Joss University in Nigeria. Um, so we really, truly appreciate your time to, to come and join the session now. And in a few weeks time, we're going to arrange a special, uh, well, one of our sessions and, uh, and we'll have ask Professor Sati to, to share with us whatever he thinks would be the best thing to share with us because obviously he's got a great deal of knowledge and understanding about a professor of history in, in, in Joss. And so we're, we're really grateful that you're here. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward um, to I want, Okay, thank you very much. I wonder if you've got any other questions for David then? Uh, not immediately. Okay. No, um, okay then. Could I just ask um, yeah. David, <clears throat> at, at this time, the economic conditions in the highlands, uh, does this coincide at all with the clearances and, uh, uh, and other economic movements? Yes, it does. Um, and, I, and I think the relationship between them is quite complex. Um, there's certainly, an, there's certainly an, an involvement in slave plantations in the Caribbean before, a significant involvement before the clearances. And, um, and the, for anybody who doesn't know, the, the clearances it, it, roughly from the 1790s up until the 1850s is the removal of people from land to create large sheep farms. And I think that, that there's an interesting, I mean, this is interesting because it's also about textile history that, that Liz has, has been talking about. Um, the, 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 the relationship's complex. I mean, and, and some of it is people seizing, the, seizing opportunities, um, but some of it is also people who've made money in the Caribbean, buying up Highland estates and, 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 and clearing them. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the most notorious um, clearances is of the island of Rassi off, uh, off the west coast which and the island was cleared by a man called George Rainey. Now I say it's one of the most important because it's become almost iconic of the Highland clearances through a Gaelic poem written by Sorley MacLean um, which is about the clearance of, of, of Rassi. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that Rassi, George Rainey, who cleared it, had come from the Highlands. He was the son of a Church of Scotland minister in, in Sutherland. And he was the 
the principal partner on the ground for uh, Sandbatch Parker, um, who um, Jim had mentioned earlier. So he's had the direct experience of running slave plantations, comes back, uses his wealth, and from the detail, he seems to act in very in something that seems similar to to the way in which a plantation owner might have. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that the the conditions in the Highlands were anything like the conditions of, of people under slavery, but I think you can see an influence. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've just got a comment from Cathy in the in the comments list um, to say that the relative wealth and development of the west coast of the Highlands of Scotland was kickstarted by the export of fish to the West Indies for use as cheap food for slaves. So, so that, that makes, makes sense. sense. Um, yes, and um, then, and it, sorry, and then I was just going. It's a major to say, market. Yeah. And Catherine also comments on the same, the same um, point. Um, and many street names are names of the plantations in Guyana, um, even in her village in Easter Ross, something that villagers found a way to mark during the summer by putting up signs interpreting mm -hmm. each of these, these street signs. So many um, folks, she said, born and living in the village for many years didn't know that. So. Uh, thank you for these these comments. It's really helpful. Okay. Uh, yes, they're, they're, they're both really important comments. Professor Sati. Yeah, just uh, one question just struck my mind now, and it's about the question of compensation to slave owners or former slave owners. Um, I was wondering, did all of the slave owners collect the compensation and move into plantation or did some branch into other uh, forms of industry? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of diversification. Um, some, of them, some of them use that money um, for the transition um, from an ens enslaved labor force to indentured labor. Okay. And one of the leading figures in that is Henry Barclay, whose uh, picture I, I showed. And, and he, along with Gladstone and a couple of other merchants, mm. are the first are bring, bring the, the first indentured labourers to Guyana from from India. Um, but others are trying to to repatriate the money to to Britain and then diversify their their, their investments. And the photographs that Liz is going to show uh, of Paltala House. It, that's an example of a family from the Western Highlands who've mm. made money in Jamaica. You can see the, you can visibly see the wealth of what they build here, but they've also diversified into sheep farming in Australia. Okay. Um, so, so, and, so the, uh, and the same is true of that big company, Sandbatch Park, uh, Sandbatch, Sandbatch Tine. Mm. Um, they diversify, they diversify into shipping. Um, and they become the main shipping company, which is is bringing indentured labourers to to the Caribbean. Um, so, so the diversification is, is, is very is very important in, in, in understanding, in following the money and understanding where, where, where it went. Okay, a footnote to that question is: um, Do these brothers uh, David and William Buckley's do they belong to this generation, the the, the bank founders? They're not the bank founders, and it's it's a, it's a different spelling of Barclay, with okay. with a K. Okay. So okay. there, I don't I don't think there's a connection with the banking family. Um, okay. But the connections with banking are important because um, the development of the banking system, I think, is is also tied up with all of the systems of. Yes. Uh, we, um, yes. There isn't time to talk about all of the systems of credit that you need mm. Mm. in the slave trade are part of what forms the model for the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I, th I think um, the work of Eric Williams and then of Inikori, um, are, you know, do, they, I think, were the first to show how the financial systems, their development was, was, was an outcome of the slave trade and slave plantation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, everybody. We've got more opportunity for um, uh, discussing some, some of the other threads we've been talking about over the last few weeks um, in a few moments. 
Um, and then when the, the session officially finishes and we finish recording at half past one in your time, um, then uh, we, we've we got opportunities there for further conversation and discussion. It's a little bit, bit more informal. But as um, David said, um, he shared some photographs with me that I was fascinated by, photographs of Paul Taloch House. Um, so Simon, is it possible to see those photographs? We have permission from um, Skylar Brown, who's based in the States, who took these photographs. Simon, is it possible to see them? Doesn't look like Simon's around at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if we get a chance, we'll, we'll have a look at the photographs of Paul Tallach House, because uh, it, it rather reminded me of photographs that you've taken, Caroline, of um, exotic ruined properties. Um, and sometimes we romanticise that history. So we also have properties that are not ruined, like Penryn Castle, this is maintained in its full glory by the National Trust. But it's good to know now that the National Trust are honestly telling their story. And uh, they've now uh, published an article, a long article, identifying uh, the links that their properties, properties they're responsible for, had with the slave trade. And that applies in England and Wales. So what's fascinating here is that we're linking up with Scotland and I thank you so much, David, because you bring another dimension to the the story of uh, colonialization and and um, could, and slavery. Um, Liz, which could, could, is good. Could I could I just say yeah. something else? I've, I've only yeah. just realised that we've been joined by Ailey McKenzie, who right? wrote the song that I referred oh, to at, Ailey, at the end lovely. of my presentation. Wonderful. If, well, Ailey, if, we if won't... you speak nicely. If I speak nicely? She might sing it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no chance. Um, no, apologies, I was late. I was in another meeting. But um, yeah, it's lovely to, to see you all and to be able to come along to this. Well, wonderful. Well, so, Ailey, would it be possible to invite you in the future or maybe you've got you a recording of, uh, of yes. the song? No, um, I would be very happy to share the recording. Um, I think, David, did I send you the link to the song? Maybe not. Um, no, you, no, you haven't. I haven't, no, okay. No, no. Um, I will do that. It's going to go up on Bandcamp in the next couple of weeks in time for the Blast Festival when it will be um, shown publicly and free to anybody who wants to watch it. That will, that be, will wonderful. be wonderful. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Okay, no bother. And again, uh, creative artists, um, uh, to engage with creative artists in this telling of these difficult stories, these difficult histories, and helping with the research, helping share the, share the research and linking people together and linking, linking ideas and, and understanding together is so important. So um, I wonder if Simon's back at his station yet? I, I'm here, but for some reason the <clears throat> sharing is not working. Okay, well... Uh, uh, I'm trying to get it back. I'm working on it. This is why we're practising. So let me know if you get to a point where you think we may be able to have a look at the, the, uh, yep. the photographs. Um, you'll, you'll see the pictures of... Yeah, as I was saying, it's, it's just fascinating to me the, the, the sort of romanticism and, and when uh, we were doing the project on uh, uh, Welsh Plains uh, last year, looking at the production of the cloth that was um, sent as part of the, the, the slave tra trade triangle, um, that we came across these picturesque um, paintings of beautiful fulling mills in leafy little valleys Whereas in actual fact, a fulling mill would have been a horrible, stinking environment um, and look anything other than picturesque. But somehow the, this, this uh, image has, has been portrayed. So we'll ma maybe have a chance to do that. So a few more welcomes. Welcome, Maggie. It's really lovely to see you. <laughs> Absolutely great. And it's great to see uh, Josie here as well. She's got her name up. 
Um, that's fine. Thank and Josie's going to be joining us next week because Josie's going. Oh, lovely, Josie. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about next week, just to uh, inspire people to sign in again? Oh, um, OK. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. I apologize. I came late. I had another meeting and uh, but here I am. <laughs> I um I will be talking about obviously I'm sure most of you know about Barclough and have heard about it. I will briefly touch on how it's made, where it comes from. It's a Ugandan Barclough I'll be talking about, and the story behind you know Bark, and then I will then take it into my work with what I have done with it and where I've taken it and then I will have some pieces to share from my Signs of the Now installation that happened last year and I feel that it's such a current um, uh, story that I will keep it going through all my collections going forward because it kind of links so much of what's happening in the world today told through fashion and so yeah I'm more um, depth add more depth to fashion than usually is attached to fashion and um, yeah so I will be sharing each um, garment and talking about what it stands for and the story behind it and I hope that it will be interesting but also to kind of create the link between most of what you've been talking about now the fact that Barclos was touched by colonization and touched by uh, so many of the stories that we've been hearing through these conversations that we've had. Um, I know researching into a book I'm trying to put together on bark cloth, that I can't just talk about the cloth now. The history of the cloth is very important and how it's been um, almost destroyed in the past and yet it's kept, you know, kept going somehow and so bring it into what's happening now because it was there when slavery happened and all of these things are still all connected somehow one way or the other i might not go into de the depth of what the connections is connection but connects it to the stories now but i'm very much aware that these stories have kind of pushed me to go back and look which is so interesting because I came thinking I'm going to be hearing about all these stories about, you know, the cloth, you know, the washcloth and the, you know, the, the um, and the um, Scottish, Scottish cloth as well, a slavery cloth. But to see the connections now and see how these things all have connections. And I'm really grateful to Simon because he kind of started this conversation with me and made me look at how David Livingstone had connected with Barcloth in his journey through um, Africa and also seeing how I can't just talk about Barcloth now. The story, I've always believed the stories are important. You know, the history of things is so, so important because if we understand the history of things then we understand their place in society now and how to push them going forward, taking inspiration from what happened before, getting rid of the negative connotations and the negative attachments to these things is really important. <laughs> and yeah, so this is, sorry, I'm going on a bit. So yeah, I'll be talking about these things. And if you do have anything in particular you want me to address, do let me know and I'll try and see if I can put that in there as well. But thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to this, I really do. Well, I think after you've, you've told us a little bit about it, I'm sure we're all very, very interested. And just to go back to your first point, I'm sure you all know about bark cloth. The answer to that is no. Many and of us will never have heard of it before. I've heard of it in the last year because I was researching the, the Welsh Plains cloth. Yeah. But um, wow. Well, I'm wearing it. I was wearing it last week and I'm wearing it today. But most people right. know it as this, 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 in this color, in the terracotta. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing the black version. So it is made right. from this particular one to make, turn it into the black one as well. I don't turn it black. The men who make it do this. But it's a whole interesting story. I'll now be sharing that with you as well. Right. Well, we're really, really looking forward to that. That's absolutely fascinating. And again, creative artists involved in telling the, 
telling the stories. So, uh, and these connections through conversations, I think, are absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, now, I'm just going to ask Helen, um, who's managed to get along today again because uh, she had surgery what, 10 days ago now, yeah. but you're obviously managing to walk better now and, and coping. So um, you uh, have written a fascinating book. I'm reassured it's fascinating because my colleague Caroline Sansom has read it, um, which is called The Butterfly and the Bee. And this story follows a thread that we've been um, uh, working our way through. And that's the thread about Henry Morton Stanley. So uh, Gwyneth started us on this conversation about Henry Morton Stanley. I invited you to come along and, and start that conversation. And now we've got to the part of the conversation where we were going to hear just a little bit about your book and then give Caroline a chance to say how much she enjoyed it because she raved on to me. Okay. All right. Well, as brief as I can, um, the character who is uh, the main character in the book is Dorothy Tennant. And I discovered her when I was reading about uh, Stanley in the book by Tim Geale. And at that time, I was on my way back to Ethiopia, where I'd been working. And uh, I used uh, some of the information in that uh, to help write uh, some of the textbooks on civics for Ethiopia. But what was really fascinating me at the time was th this uh, thread about Dorothy Tennant, uh, Stanley's wife. Uh, and one reason was that she was a children's book illustrator, which was something I'd only recently been trained to do. Uh, she was also um, linked to Wales. Her father had made his money in uh, South Wales on the canals. And she was a socialite. Um, her mother and her, um, had a house in, uh, in Richmond Terrace in the centre of London. And they entertained. They entertained Liberal MPs. They entertained artists, uh, musicians, writers. And on one occasion, uh, because the editor of the... Uh, I think it's the Telegraph, couldn't make it, Henry Morton Stanley was invited. And it just so happened that he was invited on the day that Gladstone had been invited as well, because he'd only just gone into the opposition and he'd moved in next door. And at that time, it was more of a coup to actually get Gladstone there than it was to get Stanley there. But Dorothy had, uh, he, he, he was attractive to Dorothy, but not in the same way that she was attractive to him. So when she actually turned down his proposal of marriage, he went off back to Africa and he did one of the worst um, periods of actually being in Africa when he um, tried to find Emin Pasha. <clears throat> and that was from 1885. He eventually returned in 1890. He'd found Emin Pasha. He'd lost a lot of men on the journey, uh, but he returned to London and uh, Dorothy by then, realized that he was very famous and she wanted him. And part of my book really is how she managed then to get him. So that you think of Stanley being very strong and uh, you know afraid of nothing, but she actually uh, put the fear of God in him at times. So uh, that was basically the theme of the story. Well, I, I just think this is amazing. I, I've read the, uh, the snippet that you're allowed to read on on Amazon or wherever, um, uh, just absolutely riveted with it. And um, so I can't wait to read it. So Caroline, what did you think of reading this this book? Well, it was a book I couldn't put down. I read it in about three days uh, earlier this week. Um, once I got into the story, it was just fascinating because it was um, set in London in the 1880s, which was a time when a lot of my ancestors lived in London. Um, so I, I would know a bit about their lives and it sort of gave me such an, an insight into what life was like at that time, all the parties and the meeting people and the, you know, afternoon get togethers and dinners, everything, I, the whole social history aspect of it, I absolutely loved. And I, I love the fact that Helen's quoted from their own words. So you've got Doris's own diary and her letters. Um, so you really feel as though you get to know the characters. It's absolutely brilliant. I did some looking up of her paintings afterwards. She was a fantastic artist. And I realised that I'd seen one of her original paintings at the Lady Lever Gallery in Liverpool. 
couple of years ago when I went with my art class. Um, it, it's just a fascinating book, and I love the fact that it um, alternates between Stanley's story of, of what's going on in Africa, and then Dorothy at home with various infatuations with different married men, and eventually she realises that it is Stanley that she loves because she turns down his initial proposal um, of marriage before he goes off to Africa for about three years and then is absolutely terrified that he's going to die because she realises actually she is going to marry him. She does want him. Um, well, I, I think this just speaks to the fact that historical um, fiction is so valuable um, and so important because I can't imagine Caroline speaking in quite the same way, um, re reporting back on some of the many other books that we've got that, that tell the historical story, which can be really quite hard to, to keep, keep focused on. Mm -hmm. But historical fiction can take you into the, into the time to meet the characters in a, in a, in a very special way. So um, it, I think it's really uh, a, a fantastic medium, and it's something that I, I have to say I came to very, very late on. But anyway, that, that's good. So thank you very, very much indeed, um, Helen, for uh, sharing a little bit there, and we're going to hear, hear more. Um, and Helen, your interesting um, experience of working in um, Ethiopia, you've, you've also written a book uh, for children about the Battle of Adawa, yeah. and that really fascinates me. And the story of Haile Selassie's time in the UK fascinates me very much. And we have Yasa Safari with us here today, and in a few moments he's going to take over and uh, do the final part of the session for us. Um, but um, Yasa and, and I uh, explored the story of um, Haile Selassie in, in the UK, we went to Dunham Massey, we went to uh, Fairfield House on a number of occasions. So that would be really interesting to, to follow that up and to, uh, um, to have people perhaps read that, the, the children's book on the Battle of Adawa. Because one of the stories of black history that is very rarely told, I, I don't know of anyone else who's ever told this story in Black History Month is the story of uh, His Imperial Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie and his story is so significant for some reason it's uh, it's often not, it's not been included in the mainstream of Black History teaching so um, we'll certainly follow that one up. Yeah just out of interest the um, obviously the Battle of Adwa was long before Haile Selassie was born. Yes yes I know that uh, yeah. And the same thing for the same publisher I did a book called the uh, story it's back in time uh, to the Battle of, to the Korean War and so I think that's also available through Amazon but that actually is in Haile Selassie's time and it was the part that Ethiopians played in the Korean War. Right right Oh, very interesting again, and, and all these things, you things that we can share. So thank you very much. Thank now, you. we're also following up, um, as I mentioned earlier, the story of, we started with hearing Belong's research into um, the return of um, David Livingstone's body to um, the UK and the Africans who, um, who managed that incredible achievement. Um, then we looked at uh, Henry um, Morton Stanley. So Gwyneth, we're talking about, are you there Gwyneth? Can't see you. Um, Gwyneth, we're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, having a, a special conference. This was a request by um, Norbert, who was with us uh, last week and the week before. And Norbert's, um, uh, been exploring the links between the Congo and uh, North Wales and we thought that it would be appropriate at the beginning of December did we say Gwyneth that we have one of these sessions and we invite um, speakers to talk around around that theme um, and that would make a really really interesting session I think so um, Norbert 
um, said that he was so sorry that Learning Links International wasn't running a conference on Black History this year. We've run these conferences every year for the last few years. Um, so that would be our opportunity. Really, these lunchtime conversations are our interpretation of the conference. Um, Yasser Safara, you wanted to uh, join, ask I'm, something. I'll just yes, get back. Um, just, oh, I'm sorry. Gwyneth first then, Gwyneth. Oh, yes, just to say uh, it was the 4th of December, wasn't it? it was right, 4th of December, yeah. Two hours. And I did speak to Tim Gill, the author of right. Living and Stanley and various other books and uh, he would be willing to come along and take part in the okay. conversation. So Wonderful. We'll, well done, uh, Gwyneth. So we'll, <laughs> we'll build that up. And, and if any of you look at the website, um, the, there are tabs for all the dates that are coming up and when we've got ideas, we put them there so we have a chance of remembering what we're doing. Okay then, so Yasis, you wanted to come in. Just a point of clarity in relation to the Battle of Addo, um, in terms of the, the lady Arthur that just spoke. Yeah. Uh, the Hello. Battle of Addo was in 1896. And his Imperial Majesty was born in 1892. So he was actually three years and eight months during the Battle of Addo. I accept that mistake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Yassis is, uh, is uh, an author. Yassis is the author of uh, a book called Overstanding Rastafari, Jamaica's Gift to the World. Um, a remarkable publication. Um, it's been very, very well reviewed. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's copies available at the moment, but um, there are copies in libraries, I'm sure. Um, so I think the next thing to do, Yasis, would be to, to hand over to you. Can I just check in case there's anybody else who wants to add anything else before we do that? Professor Sati. Professor Sati, did you want to add anything else? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, the Battle of Adwa and the 1936 um, invasion of uh, Ethiopia by Italy we teach it as uh, we adore Ethiopian history for these great achievements. And we look at Ethiopia as a country with an unbroken historical continuum uh, without um, a very long period of um, foreign rule. So we look at Ethiopia as a distinct country in Africa. Uh, we look at Ethiopia as a country with an unbroken history and we look at Ethiopia as a very important uh, legacy of the African tradition. That's Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that. It is very important, a very important story. Thank you. Um, yes, then I'll, uh, I'll hand over to you then now then, um, and you're going to, well, you explain what you're going to talk about this lunchtime. Okay, thank you. Good to be here. Greetings to everyone brilliant presentation so far. And just to round out on the Battle of Adawa, I happen to have visited Ethiopia at the invitation of the government in, in 1996 to commemorate the centenary of the Battle of Adawa. It's a very significant story, need to be told and retold, so we commend the author for, for revisiting that. And certainly in terms of what Professor Sati just said, uh, the, the, the role of Ethiopia as an African unconquered territory that me, has maintained a territorial integrity and independence for, for, for thousands of years. That's important for us in the African tradition and in the global reality of the human experience on the planet Earth, which leads us into my presentation, speaking to the role of the heroes and sheroes in Jamaica as part of the liberation struggle for Jamaica uh, and also to help to advance the entire welfare of the human race, which is a part of the national pledge of Jamaica. And so we want to look at the context really, because Africa is the cradle of humanity and civilization. And so Africa gave birth to civilization, to humanity, to settled communities, to the first revolution, which is agricultural revolution. And so long before Europe, became dominant, Africa was the global world power. 
And so the transatlantic slave trade, which is a genocide against African people, as well as other indigenous peoples around the globe, but more specifically uh, as it relates to Africa, uh, the transatlantic triangle speaks to the colonialism and slavery and the transatlantic genocide uh, is really a triangle of debt and decay. And Jamaica's role in that was a transshipment point for enslaved people and for goods within the transatlantic triangle. And so part of our uh, purpose here and revisiting black history and certainly speaking to the heroes and sheroes that we just alluded to is really to reconfigure that triangle and incidentally, that was what inspired the birth of Learning Links International uh, in, uh, uh, about uh, 13 years ago, is really to reconfigure that triangle from one of debt and decay and genocide to one of healing, reconciliation, caring and sharing, uh, uh, atonement, and ultimately reparations and repatriation from my perspective. And so certainly, we we'll want to fast forward to the liberation struggles that led to adult suffrage, emancipation, independence, independence within the context of the neo-colonial genocide, which is a maintenance of the systems and institutions with convenient facelift, which oftentimes serve as convenient pretexts to perpetuate the, 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 the power structure of the colonialists. And so we see where, even though Jamaica became independent, independent on August 6, uh, 1962, we still maintain to this day the head of state, which is the Queen of England, who is at the head of the system of the transatlantic genocide as it relates to the British Empire. And so, so when we look at the, the so-called heroes and sheroes, we have to look at them uh, against that background and that backdrop and speak to why even in today's contemporary society, we in Jamaica and certainly from the Pan-African community and Rastafari community, we really look suspiciously at some of these celebrated heroes and sheroes and some of the iconic characters, politicians and otherwise, and, other, and, and, and from other sectors of, of, the, of, of, of the leadership in the Jamaican society. We look at them questioningly because oftentimes they are agents of maintaining the status quo. One quick example would be the current governor general, current and former governor general, who we think perpetuated the role of the first governor, who was um, Henry Morgan, who's a pirate from, from Wales. And so we think that those institutions, to some extent, still maintain this tradition of piracy and injustice and betrayal of the African people who were enslaved in Jamaica. And so let us look, for example, at the Lancaster Agreement, which led to independence, which were uh, really negotiated by two cousins, Alexander Bustamante and Norman Manley. And this led to independence, which I term as independence, because after 50 odd years, we are still not continency. Uh, the idea of, of liberation and emancipation, and for the people who perpetrated and still maintain the whole genocide, to answer to the vexing problems of the transatlantic genocide. And so, for example, on April 1963, we have an independent Hi, I'm having a bit of a technical glitch here, not being able to hear Yasus. I'm not quite sure what's happened there. Yasus, are you back with us now? That's lovely. Yasus, unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Right, I think I can hear you now, Yasus. Are you hearing me? It's very difficult to hear you. We've done so well so far with this uh, link with Jamaica because they've had terrible weather there and uh, dreadful rain and it's been a real problem affecting the technology. Yasus, can, I can't hear you at the moment. Right. 
really difficult. I, hear me. I can hear you a little bit. So try and uh, get your system working and we'll just just think on that. So it, it's fascinating to have Yasis's contribution uh, in the session today. We're also having some other technical difficulties, Yasis, with the uh, the music that we were going to play. Simon's just been telling me that uh, that there's some some difficulties that his system's frozen out. So it's obviously bad weather in Nottingham as well. Right, try again then, Yasis. Okay, are you here? No, I'm not hearing you. Oh, very strange. Okay. Hey dear, right. Okay, so um, we'll just uh, consider what we, what are the options while we struggle getting this sorted out. I explained earlier that uh, that Yasus has been a great support, and he was explaining about how the whole idea of Learning Links International came about um, all those years ago. And we, we looked at the triangle and, uh, and we had links in West Africa, we had links in uh, the Caribbean, as well as links in, uh, in the West Midlands, where I was based then. And uh, then that's how that came about. So in working now with Professor Sati, we're hoping that we'll be able to get that, that going again for Learning Links International, so it's very important. Okay, yes, let's try again, please. No, we've lost your picture now. I hear you. I can hear you now, yes. Well, I'm sorry about that. Okay, Simon here. I just managed to get back in, so I should hopefully right. be able to show Yasus's video now. Okay. Yasus, it's proving very difficult to hear you. It's very difficult to hear you. So can we have a continuation of this next week when we've got the better technical link? Okay, and what we're going to do is we're now going to recognize one of, um, perhaps someone who wasn't recognized as a Jamaican hero before, and but that's Toots. And sadly, Toots passed a few weeks ago. And oh. as the person who came up with the term reggae, Toots has a very, very special place in um, Jamaican music and in world music, in fact. And Yasus, um, along with, with a number of other reggae artists, um, produced tracks, um, shared tracks. Yasus is a, a dub poet and he, <laughs> he dubs on the track. I think that's the right way of describing it. So, Simon, if you've got Toots's track ready, then... Um, I do have it ready. I don't know if you just heard the little piece there. Uh, for some reason, no, I'm actually still having problems. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's not uh, our day today. I don't think I've got full control back from when I was sharing with David seems to be the problem. Right. Okay, then. Well, we'll, uh, we'll get that sorted again. So yeah. um, we will show this, this video again. Yasus, just see what your volume's like, will you? See if it's come back. Yasus? Yeah. Can I hear you now? Can you try that? No, it's not working. Okay, then. So um, we'll we'll wrap things up at this moment in time. I think we'll stop the recording, please, Simon. And uh, we'll say thanks very much to you all for being here. But then we'll come.